nervous about doing this podcast today <laughs> because it, I'm doing so many things on so many new levels. First of all, I finally got this Zoom H6 handy recorder, which I have been wanting to get for quite a while and finally got it. And I'm still, even as I'm recording now, I'm kind of fiddling. There we go. I think that's good. I'm trying to get these levels right. I'm not really an audio guy, so I'm learning all of this first. I, I, I'm learning all of this for the first time. So this is all very new to me. So first of all, I've never used this Zoom before, and I just hit record, and I'm hoping that it's actually recording. Otherwise, this is going to be disastrous. Second of all, this is also the first time that I'm recording uh, a bio episode on video for YouTube. I've never done that before either. And so uh, for those of you who are watching, many of you have heard these podcasts, and I talk about how I'm in, I record these in the shed. Well, that wasn't a joke <laughs> that wasn't some something for to fancy some fancy code word for my studio as you can see in the YouTube video if you're watching on YouTube that I legitimately am in a shed and so I, I was thinking about this about how you know whenever you you uh, whenever I do the these episodes especially the bio episodes I talk about how we I try to keep things as real and grounded as possible on this podcast especially in these bio episodes and I make sure to to uh, include all of the flaws that take place in people's lives. Well, here you go. This is this is my my weakness as a podcaster. I'm in literally in a shed. And yes, for those of you who are watching, there is a piece of garbage holding up <laughs> my MacBook here. And I know I'm going to get some questions about it. So the reason why is because this MacBook is very very old now. It's several years old. And I travel so extensively and so much that it has been kind of battered down over time. And it has this thing where if I push the screen back beyond about the halfway point, then it goes black. Apparently, there's some kind of wire in there that keeps it from, from I don't know what it is, some loose wire kind of thing. And so in order to use my computer now, I have to prop it up on whatever thing I can find. And in this case, it's a piece of garbage which I found as I was setting everything else up in here, trying to figure out the best setup for this. And so <laughs> you have, you are now seeing all of the nitty gritty of this show. And it is about, I think it's about 30, I want to say it's 35 degrees outside. So I have a jacket in here somewhere. I might grab, I might not. Whenever I do these, these episodes, I get all fired up. So I generally don't need my jacket, but yeah, today this is, <laughs> I'm really excited about today's episode because we were talking about Bach and or Bach I'm pretty sure it is it's Johann Bach I was trying to figure out because I, I was talking about him in other episodes previously and I wasn't sure exactly how to say his name because I, I just to be honest with you guys I don't really I love classical music but I don't really know the composers very much and I saw a quote from Bach on another website as I was just looking about looking at people and just revival carriers right people who did great things for God and Bach came up and I thought that's odd that's that composer guy and so I looked him up and I started looking at who exactly he was, what is that he did, and learned he wasn't just a composer. He was, man, this guy was a man of, he was a very complex, very awesome man. And so we're going to talk about him today. And first of all, you guys know that there are a couple things I want to say. First of all, I want to thank you guys who've been sharing. Please continue to share this and tell other people about this. I love doing this podcast and it's growing. As you can see, I'm still in the shed and I do have a piece of trash holding up my computer. But I do have the H6 handy recorder now, which I have been wanting to upgrade to for a long time. I do have these this fancy microphone, and I have it, we've got T-shirts and stuff like that, and I'm very excited about just how this is going. We have some amazing guests. I'm so excited. I can't I can't tell you about these new guests that I have coming on now because we're still confirming dates and stuff. But I have some people, guys, that are going to blow your mind, and we're just continuing to grow. And that's because of you guys sharing it, and that this thing is growing and continuing to get out there. And the other thing I want to let you guys know is that because I do, uh, as this is so much uh, work and as much as I love it, what I would like to do is you guys know that I have I, every every episode I say, hey, if you want to support this podcast there in the show notes, you can go on there and there's all the kinds of different ways to support just in the description of, of this podcast for those of you who are interested in, in keeping this thing going and just blessing the ministry that we're doing and the people that we're encouraging. I have without a doubt received more feedback from this podcast than just about anything else I've ever done. It's 
which is not what I expect at all. But one of the things I'm doing to just kind of help keep fund this podcast and allow me to keep upgrading, maybe I can get a new laptop one of these days and maybe I can get a, an actual camera instead of my iPhone because I don't even really know what it's looking at. So I'm hoping this video comes out. <laughs> this video comes out all right. This is just, I wish I could show you. My iPhone is propped up on a cardboard box right now. And that's just where we're at. That's where we're at. But we're growing and we have an incredible guest coming on who I, every single time I, I tell my wife, whenever some new guest agrees to do this show, I tell my wife, I said, I don't know why people are agreeing to do this. This is the most amazing thing I've ever done. In my, this is the most amazing thing that people that I have always wanted to talk to that have had such an impact on my life or are doing great things for the kingdom of God. They're actually willing to come on and do this podcast that I shoot in a shed. <laughs> and so uh, it, it's just, it's such a blessing. So one of the things that I'm doing that I wanted to let you know is if you go in the description, because I have had some questions and I didn't think to do this until people started asking me, but I have had some questions about the podcast equipment that I use and some of the books that I read for these, these bio podcasts and just different things. And because I'm a missionary, some people want to know about just certain, certain things about travel and, and stuff like that. So what I'm going to start doing as of this episode, there, I, I may, well, I have put in a couple episodes before, but I didn't say anything about it. But this is the first time that I'm really putting in these Amazon links that are just, it's just one of those things where if you decide you want to buy something that I talk about, like today, for example, the this book on Bach called Bach Music in the Castle of Heaven. If you are interested in buying this book, you can actually do it on Amazon and you can do it in the description of this podcast. There's a link there. And what happens is if you buy it through Amazon, uh, then what happens is I get a small percentage of what is purchased on those links. And so there's the, the microphone that I use, the handy, cam the handy uh, recorder thing, and just little things like that, the books that I read, I'll just be putting links on there. And that's just if you're interested and you're like, hey, I'd rather not give a donation, but I'd love to buy that book. I'd love to read it. And then you can do that, and I'll just get a small percentage. And, and that's just – I just want to let you guys know that that, that that is happening. And as we grow and learn how to do this more, hopefully I'll become – better at doing this and, and more sophisticated in the way that we do things. But we do need to fund it. Things like this, as they grow, they need funding. There's uh, eventually I want to start traveling and doing interviews with people on the road. And so I'll need better camera, better computer, all that kind of stuff. And so, yeah. So let's, let, let's talk about Bach, right? I, for me, this has been absolutely a fascinating, fascinating journey to be able to, to learn about this man who I had never heard of. I had heard of him, but I had never read anything about before. And so I'm, it was just such a journey. And as I learned more about him and I, and, and I had such a respect for not only this man, but also just the, the different things that God calls us to, the different gifts that God gives us and how we can develop those into really world changing and sphere shifting uh, gifts in terms of Bach, the, the, the way that he revolutionized music, the way that in his time, the amount of people that he reached, the music that he created and composed is just, just astounding. And so, yeah, the, I, I'm just, I, I'm so excited. I'm just going to, let's just, let's just get into this. Okay. So let me just, let me just start by, ju I just want to say this. As I do with all my bios, I can't fit everything that has to do with Bach his whole life into one podcast. It's just not it's just not possible. And so again, I read this book called Bach Music in the Castle of Heaven by John Elliott Gardner and Gardner. And that this book is six hundred pages pages long. It is a large tome of a book. It's it's absolutely massive. And that's not even counting the other research that I did online. I listened to hours and hours of box music i listened to all of john's passion the the well-tempered cavalier that which those are two hours each and i i listened to so much music and there, there is so much about box music and box life that it is simply not possible to fit all in a hour and a half podcast however long this goes and so uh, i want to recommend to you that you buy the book if you want to know more and you listen to the music on YouTube, you can listen to a lot of box stuff just on YouTube or, or iTunes or whatever it is that you listen. It is absolutely beautiful. It is astounding. You listen to it and the amount of detail and the instruments and 
the this the words a lot of it is in german or latin but the, it, it, I, I i can understand quite a bit of latin because it's because of spanish but it's just absolutely beautiful and so i can't stress enough to you that i i'm going to give you an overview of box life but there are several parts of his life that I'm not going to go into here just because of the detail, just because I can't. For example, there was one stint where he was actually in jail for a month. And I'm not going to really talk about that because of all the details around it. just don't have time. But if you get the book, then it goes into detail on that. There are all kinds of things that he did, all kinds of details that I just can't get into. So if you enjoy this podcast and you really are hungry for more, I just want to let tell you, 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 can, you can get more information on the show notes. And you can uh, listen to the music, and there's there's all kinds of other options for you for you to be able to learn more about Bach. So just just be aware of that. That I I am well aware that there are things that I'm going to be skipping over, and that's just because for the sake of time, right? Albert Albert Einstein famously summed up Bach in this way. He he said, "Listen, pray, love, revere, and keep your trap shut." And he said that because Bach was a very private man. Whenever he died, he left barely anything but his music behind, aside from a handful of letters between himself and his friends or his family. He was one of those people who fiercely protected his privacy, and yet to this day, people search every which way for information on him because because he was a genius. And so people want to know who this genius was. How was it that he was able to develop and compose this music? And so information is personal written information his feelings and things are are pretty scarce although of course there are large books that talk about his overall autobiography and think the acts that he did but not necessarily the motivation behind him like some of the people that we uh, look at or will look at they've got diaries and they've got writings that came personally from them Bach expressed himself entirely through music and so he didn't have a journal he had music that he composed every day and that he dedicated his life to. So Johann Sebastian Bach, he was born in Germany in 1685. Uh, Here's just some context for his life. Matthew Henry, or I should say context for the year that he was born. Matthew Henry, who is famous for his massively detailed Bible, Bible commentary, which you can get for free on eSword and other formats. You can go online. You can look it up online and find it there. But Matthew Henry, he was born in 1662, in Wales, England, and had just gotten married the year before Johann Bach was born. He was already famous. He was already preaching all over the nation whenever Bach was born. Jonathan Edwards, the American preacher who preached the most famous sermon in the United States, in the United States history, he was born during Bach's life as well. His sermon that caused shockwaves of revival, it was called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And if you have not read or gone on YouTube and listened to the, that sermon centers in the hands of an angry God. I urge you to do so. It isn't super long. That back in those days, the way that they would preach was they would write down their entire sermon word for word, and then they would just read it off in front of the congregation. They, because they believed in not having any kind of not showing emotion, because they didn't believe in uh, trying to manipulate anyone. It was a really, it was a really different time. And so uh, Jonathan Edwards, he actually, he preached this sermon and it was funny because he was not a fire and brimstone preacher. And yet this one sermon was like a fire and brimstone sermon. And so this is the one that he's famous for. So people thought that he was a fire and brimstone teacher, but whenever he, when he preached this sermon, people in the spirit, but as a congregation, the whole congregation, as he was reading this, saw the floor of the church open up and hell underneath. And they thought that they were falling into hell and they were running around trying to climb on top of chairs, climb on top of each other. It was an absolute chaotic scene. And that came from this, this sermon centers in the hands of an angry God. So I highly, highly recommend that you go and you listen to this, that sermon, read it. I know you can find it easily on YouTube or Google or whatever. David Brainerd, Brainerd, the famous missionary to the native Americans, he was born and died during Bach's life. George Whitfield and John Wesley were, were also both born and ministered during, during Bach's lifetime. Count Zinzendorf of the Moravian movement, he was born not only in Bach's time, but in his region. And if you don't know about the Moravian movement, I will do a podcast on them. But they, they were the very first global missionary movement among the Protestant church. Benjamin Franklin, he was born in 1706. So Bach had already been alive for a while. 
Bach was, he was a very, very strong, and, and we'll talk about this more, but he was a very strong Lutheran Protestant. He was not Catholic, although nowadays it's largely the Catholic Church that uses his material, unfortunately. So, but, but it, he, I, fi- I find it sad myself that more Protestant churches don't use it. And I, and I kind of understand because most Protestant churches, we have the typical worship band with the guitar and the piano and the bass and the, the electric and the drums and the, the, the singers. And that's, that's wonderful. I just, I just think that it's sad that someone as influential as Bach in the Protestant church has largely been forgotten by Christians. And so uh, he, him being a Protestant, he would have been influenced by all of these people that I just mentioned by, by, uh, yeah, the different people that I just mentioned in one way or another, he would have at least known they existed. And th- there was th- the interesting thing about Bach is that because he comp- he was a composer, he wasn't a preacher, he wasn't a minister, he was a musician. And so he had kind of a different path than a lot of these guys. If you've listened to some of my other episodes, like John Knox and John Welch in, in particular, they taught that there was so much conflict between them and the Catholic Church and and there was war and there were all these crazy things. But with Bach, because he was a composer and he composed worship, he was largely accepted by both the Protestant and Catholic churches. And so a lot of that, he, he was probably highly criticized by the, the, the majority of the Protestant church. They probably saw him as kind of a traitor because he was leading worship in mass and in Catholic churches while also leading worship in Protestant churches. And so, and the fact that the Catholics used his, his music and he allowed the Catholics to use his music is something that I'm sure was extremely controversial. And so as a result, Bach is one of the few Protestants in his time that was able to avoid severe persecution that a lot of the other Christians were going through. You know, for example, the, the Moravians, while the Moravians were ministering during Count Zinzendorf's life and the Moravians were dying for their faith, they were being killed for their faith. And Bach, he was not. He was in these beautiful churches playing, and he was famous and all these things. And people like John Wesley, who was getting dead animals thrown at him for, for, for ministering. David Brainerd, who was getting, got sick and died on the mission field. And then there's Bach, who's playing in these giant concert halls and all these things that he did, that doing music competitions and stuff. So he, I'm sure that he was very, very criticized in his life. And so during his lifetime, whenever he was born, and really throughout his life, the fallout from the Reformation was still going strong. There was a lot of turmoil in Germany in Bach's lifetime. And so here are just some interesting little things that happened around the time that Bach was born. You guys know I love I love context. For me, if I have context, then I can see it. I can visualize what was happening. And so uh, just in, in 1680... Phosphorus matches were invented, plate glass was invented in 1688, and the steam water pump in 1698. And here's something interesting. During Bach's lifetime, the piano was invented. It was invented in the year 1709, and then the tuning fork in 1711. So there was an awful lot of things that were happening during Bach's lifetime. Now, Germany... It was such a war-torn place. It was so fractured and divided when Bach was born that there was actually, th- there was so much destruction in the area. There had been so much war and just it, to the point where the land itself was scarred and destroyed. And one of the common sayings whenever people would look out at the landscape was they would simply say, it's spooky here, which Today that may sound quaint, but back in those days it was it was kind of a bigger statement to say it's spooky here. So that's what people would say about the landscape of Germany when they they would look out at it. But for the Bach family, there was something more important than the war, than probably even the Reformation. Although although Johann Bach, he idolized Luther really, but the most important thing for them was music. Most people only know about Johann Sebastian Bach 
but the Bach family was actually a musical dynasty. There were over a dozen straight generations of musical geniuses. Johann's father was the director of musicians in the town where he grew up, and they were like they were like musical royalty in the sense that they they would not marry anyone who wasn't a high level musician. Johann Bach, in his own genealogical records, he wrote down fifty three Bachs, all men, and that's in, that's that's a key thing to say that it was all men because the Bach family in all those days, including Johann himself, they were very sexist. It was pretty common in the culture there because uh, it was just common in the culture because of the times, right? It's the, it's the late 1600s, 1700s, but the Bach family were even more so because even though they had a lot of really awesome women who were excellent musicians, the, the, the Bach family never included them in their family genealogy. And they would specifically choose women who were who were very good musicians, and what they called it quote breeding up, meaning they chose women with, the, with these high musical giftings, and then paired them with men in the family so that they would give birth to even better musical children. But the women, like I said, they were not. It, it's just it, it's mind boggling because the women were not counted in the list of their musicians. But this was not the case everywhere. There were pr plenty of other musical families like the Cooperins and the Bendas who were actually the first family to surpass Bach, Bach's, the, the Bach in terms of the family line. The Bendas were the first family to surpass the Bachs in generational length of musicians who, and they also all had famous female musicians. They had opera singers and they, their women were renowned at the time. But the Bach family didn't encourage this or even they didn't even take note of it in their family, which is just, again, I don't understand it. It, it must have been something because it was over a dozen generations of mu musicians. It must have been something they had been doing for 500 years and they just kept up with that and they refused to change it. So the, the Bach family, they were also all churchgoers for sure. Before the Reformation, their ancestors wrote music for the Catholic Church and now they did it for the Protestant church. So they converted, whenever the, the Reformation happened, they, the Bach family converted converted to Protestantism. Uh, largely, well, I can't say, I, I don't want to just infer, or, or sorry, I don't want to just inject anything there, and there it isn't true, but I just, uh, I believe that it's because Luther was in that same town that Bach was in. Now, Luther was quite a bit before, but they were in the same area, and so that town was so full of Protestants because of the pride of, of Luther there and all that, that I believe the Bach family converted to Protestantism because of the connection with Luther. And it was there in this, in, it was there is actually in the Catholic church that, sorry, not, man, I'm, I'm getting all mixed up in my head here. <laughs> let me, re, let me reset this. Okay. So it was there that Bach began singing there in the Protestant church, not the Catholic church, forgive me. And he would have memorized what at that time would have been the most influential book in his life, which was a hymnal called the Complete Eisenach Songbook. It was put together by a man named Johann Gunther Rohrer in 1673. Bach probably sang from that hymnal constantly whenever he was a child. And we know this, we know how influential this was in his life because later in Bach's church music that he wrote, a lot of the tunes that he used are very similar to the tunes from the songs in that book. Another very important aspect of the Bach dynasty was that they very much compared themselves to Asaph, the psalm writer in the book of Songs, Psalms, as well as the dynasty of King David. They believed in settling in one kingdom and that be that kingdom being Germany for them and maintaining their musical empire in that area. Most other musicians of the day, they found their pride and prestige and the amount of places they had traveled. But Bach, they, the, the Bach family, they seemed to view it more like leaving Israel to go to the Gentiles. And so they stayed in Germany. The Bach, the Bach had yearly fam family reunions where they would come together. They'd have wild parties. They would sing famous songs together and then change the words into jokes and inappropriate innuendos and they would just all all laugh together about it they also took their focus on the men 
as something they, they was something that they believed the Old Testament taught. They actually even would elect patriarchs who were the heads of the family. Johann Bach, he became the patriarch of his family. Of course, it's it's Johann at the age of 50, which the family celebrated in, in their family. They would celebrate the 50th year as the biblical year of Jubilee. So whenever a Bach man hit the age of 50, that was whenever they were considered to be worthy to be patriarchs as elders in the family. And they were they were voted in. It was it was an interesting, a very, very interesting thing. Now, all of that said, every aspect of Bach's life was permeated with music and the church. That was everything that he knew from the time he was born. And honestly, it is as if God handpicked him for such a time as that because of the the incredible, incredible life that he had. Now, Johann's life was fairly stable. It was full of music, full of church, full of worship until he turned nine. When he was nine years old in 1694, his mother died. And then eight months later, his father died, leaving Johann and his siblings orphans. And it was then that Johann Sebastian moved in with his oldest brother, Johann Christoph Bach. It was during these youngest years that Bach's earliest musical writings have been found. It's funny because Bach, you, you will see this as we go through this. He was always a rebel, always, always a rebel. And so even from the time he was a child, even whenever he was 10 years old, he was writing music, but it was forbidden. He was actually forbidden from utilizing the scores that his brother and the church where he served had because they were so pr- – what he would do is he would take these scores – music that was already written, and he would copy them by hand. But the, in those days, the, the music that he was getting, it was really rare, and it was music because they were the box, right? They were a musical dynasty. And so they had access to very sp- – the, being the oldest brother, Johann Christoph, he had access and had music stored, saved, that was, that was really, really precious to the family, and Johann would steal it. He would take it from his brother or take it from the church, and he would copy it at, by hand. And then on top of that, paper was expensive back then. The first paper mill in America was established in Philadelphia in 1690. In, in Europe, back in those days, in the 1700s, uh, late late 1600s, early, early 1700s, paper was being made from rags. And there was actually such a, such a shortage that it became illegal to take rags out of the country. And believe it or not, this is going to sound really funny, but smuggling rags became a really lucrative business. It was like the the bootleg, what is it, moonshine here in the States whenever they had prohibition and moonshine was the whole thing. Back in Europe, it was rags. They would actually have these huge competitions and offer gigantic prizes, money prizes for anyone who could invent a new way to make paper investors from all over the world, scientists, they were all working hard on how to create new forms of paper while Bach, child Bach, was stealing paper and just copying music by the pages on it. In in school during these days, Bach, he was taught Latin, he was taught Greek, he was taught French and Italian, along with all of the other studies that he had. And during these years, as Bach grew in his talent and musical ability, his brother, who had been working tirelessly for him to provide not only for Bach, but for his wife and his children, uh, Johann Sebastian, he he started to, um, oh, how do I say this? Uh, he started to have health, well, it's, it's just simple. He had health problems. And so the, not Johann Sebastian, sorry, Johann Christoph, the, the brother, the oldest brother, he had been working so hard that he started having health he was just physically exhausted. And so he was having all these health problems. And so Johann Sebastian wanted to help with the family. And the opportunity arrived when the townspeople voted for the part-time mayor to provide 800 florins to upgrade the church organ. The mayor, he wanted to ensure. So, so in those days, just to clarify real quick, in those days, the, the church and state there was no separation of church and, church and state. The back then, they were one. So what would happen is the townspeople 
they would make take a vote and they would decide to buy a new organ for the church because the church was the center of the community back then. It was a very, very religious, whether it was Catholic or Christian, Protestant, and Bach in particular, he was in the, the, the uh, Protestant church. But the townspeople there, they had voted for this new organ to be made. And so the, the governing officials, they would pay the money for the organ to be made. The organ would be crafted by a a renowned craftsman because they're, it's going to spend that much money on it. And then they were hire They would hire somebody, a professional musician to then inspect the instrument that had been created. And so the, the mayor of town, he wanted to ensure that he's going to pay these 800 florins. He wants the best of the best. And so he asked, he requested from the Bach family that they would send one of their people to examine the organ and ensure that it was the highest quality organ organ. And so the family chose 18-year-old Johann Sebastian, Auerbach, the one that we're looking at, to ensure that that was the, the organ was in top quality. And so Bach, at, eight, at 18 years old, he went, he spent a few days examining literally every inch of the organ. He would check the, the width of the reeds and the pipes. He would measure it. He tested the sounds, absolutely everything to make sure that the craftsman had not cut any corners. And so after a few days of Bach studying and checking out this thing, he gave it the thumbs up. And whenever he did that, he was paid a big chunk of money from the town's beer tax. That's how they paid Bach. They took money from the tax that was on the beers of the, the beer back then, and they paid, for, they paid Bach to do this. And upon him doing it, not only was he offered this job, but he was also offered this job of... of checking out and examining this organ but he was also then offered the job to be the organist for the church because i figured this guy knows organs better than anybody else he's he's our man to then uh do the uh, be play the organ why not right it wasn't long after this that same year that several box died including his older brother christoph he had been having these health problems from working so hard and his brother died However, his brother had been setting him up over the past eight years and had trained him enough that at that point, even as a young man, he had started to gain some notoriety. He was seen as the up-and-coming talent in the Bach family. And just, just an interesting fact for those of you who are classical music fans, Bach was the same age as George Frederick, Frederick Handel. They both turned 18 uh, uh, in 1703. Also, the first opera in history had been written two years before in 1701 by the 12-year-old son of a university deacon named Telemann. It is said that Bach may have attempted to get involved in the theater, but that the music was either not sophisticated enough for him or it was too simple. What we do know, though, is that he went on to create his own type of hybrid music with operatic elements, especially in his passions and cantatas. Like I said, as I was preparing for this, I listened to John's Passion, which is, it is mesmerizing, guys. It's, it is two hours of just sweeping music and beautiful people singing and worshiping. It's all about, the, it's about the gospel. It's the gospel of John, and it's awesome. It's not in English. It's in German, but wow, I, I'm telling you guys, you need to go listen to it. It's on YouTube. They have a whole like orchestra group that that performs it and they're they're wonderful. As is often the case, Bach's immense immense talent began to grow into immense pride. This this happens so often whenever people have incredible talent. It's actually a very sad thing that happens. And so at this point he began to have clashes in the church that he was a part of. He thought that their musicians and their singers were no good and it was even he was even quoted as calling the bassoon player a weenie, which I assume back then was probably a pretty intense insult because the the leaders of the church came together and reprimanded it re- reprimanded him for calling the bassoon player a weenie and told him to lower his expectations of the church music, musicians. Isn't that funny how he he just de- he was a man of excellence. He just de- he demanded excellence and the church leaders came and said hey they're not going to be that good (laughs) i just i love that i think it's funny and so bach of course he 
coming from a musical dynasty that did not lower their expectations of anyone that was supposed to be a musician, he refused to do so. He refused to lower his ex- expectations, and he actually decided to leave that church. And in 1706, he applied for a position at Blasius Church in another part of Germany, and he was accepted because, of course, he was. He's Bach. He's a Bach. He wasn't the Bach that we know at the time because he hadn't grown and all of that just yet, but he was a Bach and they were renowned. And so whenever he agreed to transfer, they of course took him. So regardless of this immaturity, Bach had a fierce loyalty to the church in particular to Martin Luther. Like I said, not only did he respect what Luther had done in sparking the reformation, but he also took great pride in the fact that Martin Luther had been a choir boy in the exact same church that he had been. He and Luther had been to the same Latin school And the fact that Luther was German and he was German played a part in this as well. Because remember, the Bach family loyalty to Germany. And while Bach is mostly listened to by secular musicians today and played on secular radio, the fact is that almost everything that Bach did was for the church. The music that he composed was all done for the glory of God and totally changed the way that music was viewed in many ways. He actually signed all of his cantatas with the letters SDG, which is the acronym for uh, for the Latin phrase soli deo gloria, which means to only God be the glory. If you want to know more about Martin Luther, because, because of Bach's fascination with him, go back and listen to episode four of this podcast on John Knox. There's a lot more information there. But Bach believed that Luther taught, or Bach believed what Luther taught on music who was quoted as saying, Luther was quoted as saying, the notes make the words live. In other words, music is spiritual in nature and that God gave it to man to bring depth to to biblical texts. The book, Music in the Castle of Heaven, it describes it this way. As two of God's most powerful gifts from heaven, words and music must be forged into one invisible an indivisible, indivisible force, the text appearing or appealing primarily to the intellect, but also the passions, while music addresses primarily the passions, but also the intellect. Luther said that without music, man is barely more than a stone, and that with music, the devil can be driven away. Luther also said, it has often revived me and relieved me from heavy burdens. So Bach clung to this teaching and this belief as well throughout his entire life. And he believed that when he wrote music, it was producing and declaring life around him. An interesting note about Martin Luther, he would often ask people why the devil was allowed to have the best music and that it shouldn't be that way. So this is, I I love this. These are things about religiosity that make me laugh because sometimes I hear people talk in such a religious way. They take such a religious position on things without knowing history, without knowing church history at all. And so, for example, Martin Luther, he he thought the devil had the best music and he didn't like that. So he would go and he would take secular music. He would take bar tunes and other songs that the whole congregation would know from the world and then he would add Christian lyrics to it. He would change the secular lyrics into Christian music, into Christian lyrics. And that's where a lot of our church hymns come from today. Imagine if someone took a secular song today, and I don't know what is popular right now. I did a quick Google search of the most popular musician in 2020, and Lady Gaga was the first person to come up. I've never heard any of her music, but imagine if someone took whatever her most popular song is, and added Christian words to it, and then sang that song in church. I realize that they would get sued today for that, but that is exactly what Luther did. So if you're singing older traditional hymns that you believe are so, so sacred and untouchable, just know that you are singing the Lady Gaga tunes of the 1500s. That's that's just so, That's I just want that to sink in for a minute while I take a drink of water here real quick. Let that sink in. Death was always surrounding Bach. He lived with a constant understanding of how necessary it is to be prepared for death. Not only did both of his parents die before the age of 50, but Bach himself had 20 children in his life, and 12 of them died before the age of three. For those of you wondering why so many people were dying around him, 
you should take into account something that we seriously take advantage of. And that is the fact that people today live to their 80s and their 90s. And that's kind of people. If someone dies when they're 60, it's considered really young. Even 70 is considered young. And people today live 80, 90 on the news all the time. You're seeing people who are 110 years old. But in the 1700s, life expectancy was 35. That was how long people were expected to live. And that's how it was for several thousand years. Whenever the Apostle Paul writes in his epistles that he is Paul the aged, he was most likely in his mid-50s, which was considered very old in those days. And I know what I'm about to say may offend some people, but this is actually why that whole ancestral diet that people are doing, what do they call ancient, the ancient grains and all that junk that people talk about, they try to eat like our ancestors. Look, that is hilarious because our ancestors lived to be 35 years old. And we may have chemicals and all kinds of junk in our food, but we are far better nourished than a, they ever were if we're living as long as we do. So I always think it's funny when people, oh, the, the ancient elders used to eat whatever it was, raw fish eyeballs, and that's why they lived to be 20. Come on, guys. Don't just accept things because some, it's put on a bag of bread. I saw that in Walmart the other day. We were there, and there were all these bags of bread. It's an ancient, ancient grain bread, and I just laughed because people who think that you're going to get healthy because of eating like people did 2,000, 5,000 years ago, um, you're, you're wrong because <laughs> this, this is not true. Bach played and wrote worship for Blasius Church for two years, and it was there that he married his second cousin, Maria Barbara Bach. Not a lot is no, of no, sorry, not a lot is known about Maria except that they had a happy marriage. Her, their son actually used the word blissful. They had a blissful marriage, and that's that was kind of the highlight of those two years in Blasius Church. Because then he transferred back to Weimar, which is the church that he had recently criticized and called the bassoonist a wiener. This time he stayed in, in Weimar for nine full years. So he was there until 1717. 1717. It was during those years that Bach began to compose his massive work, The Well-Tempered Clavier, which is an hour and 45 minute, minutes of piano, and it is written in two full books. I watched a guy on YouTube perform the whole thing. And all I could think of the whole time was how on earth are this guy's fingers not collapsing in on themselves? Because I don't play piano. I'm not a musician, but I tried playing guitar once and my fingers were killing me after just a minute. And so, and I know, I know people who play a long time, they get calluses and their fingers get strong, but still an hour and 45 minutes of playing piano straight through. How do you do that? That's incredible. It's, it's most likely that he did compose more music during this time, but he didn't save them because he felt the sound was outdated. He said that the former style of music no longer seems to please our ears. And so it's largely believed that he composed other music and he threw it away because he didn't think that it was up to snuff for the times. So in 1717, Bach transferred yet again to a town called Leipzig, which right now is the most populous city in the prov province of Saxony and Germany. When he transferred there, not only was his job to teach music and lead the singer, singers, but he was also assigned to be the Latin teacher. However, instead of taking on the job of teaching Latin full time and wanting to, he, he wanted to dedicate himself to music. That was what his passion was. What he did was he brought on four deputies and he trained them to teach Latin in his place, which I just find interesting. I find it very interesting that he was allowed, that the, the church leaders hired one man to teach Latin, but he needed to divide the work into four different people. And so I, I don't quite understand it, but it's just interesting. Why didn't they bring on four guys? I don't know. Maybe, maybe they were volunteers and didn't get paid or something like that. But Bach composed a massive amount of cantatas during his time in Leipzig. The majority uh, were, were during his first three years. In the first three years, he composed 300 cantatas, over 300. We don't exactly know how many because uh, oh, at least 100 have been lost over time. Can you imagine? There are 100 plus pieces of music from Bach that have just vanished. We don't know what it sounds like. We don't know what it was. And... I, I think that's just 
Wow. As for why there was a sudden drop in composing after three years, it can be reasonably suggested, reasonably suggested that it was because of this life-changing event that happened in 1720. After three years of his time in Leipzig, Bach was invited by a prince, Prince Leopold, and there's a long name. I'm going to try and say this. Prince Leopold of Anhalt Cohen, uh, which was to a, a town. Prince Leopold invited him to go to a place called Carlsbad, which was and is still an important spa town, 130 miles from home, which when you're going on horse or you're walking, that is a very, very long way away. And when he was there, his wife of 12 years, Maria, she was, she had, he left her, she was pregnant with their fifth child, who they were actually going to name Leopold after the prince, which should show you how close of friends they were with Leopold. But whenever he was on his trip, he was gone for two months. And while he was there, he was playing what is, as of now, from what we know, it is considered to be the earliest known summer festival for the performing arts. And so whenever Bach was there, uh, when he left, Maria was in perfectly good health, but she suddenly died for unknown reasons while he was gone. Uh, he, he was traveling, and then he, she got sick, and there were people with her, but they, they didn't really know what she had, but suddenly she just died. And, of course, because she had not given birth, Leopold, their baby, also died. And so whenever Bach returned, he came back all excited and joyous because of this summer festival. He had just been part of this historic thing and he returned and found that his wife and his baby, his unborn child had died. And Bach was, he was completely devastated by this, of course. And, uh, he had all of these children he had to take care of and he couldn't do it on his own and being Bach and being so focused on music, he, remarried fairly quickly. He, he remarried 17 months later. He married a woman named Anna Magdalena Wilk, and almost nothing is known about her, to be honest. It's, there's very, very little information on her, other than the fact that, once again, their marriage seemed to have been uh, really good. That there's Interestingly, with a lot of these people who are geniuses or they're very, very busy in kingdom work, a lot of times there's a lot of marriage problems. But Bach, he was a good husband and a good father. There is virtually no complaints about him by his children seem to love him. His wife seemed to love him. They, like I said, their children said his first marriage was blissful. They had only positive things about his second, his second wife. They, he seemed to be just a great family man. And so, uh, yeah, that's, I, I just, I love that because so often you don't see that. Now, Bach, in terms of being a Christian, because we're, ta we're talking about revival carriers, right? We're not here just to do a little bio on Bach, the composer. We want to talk about him as a revival carrier, as a man who did great things for the kingdom of God. And if you've heard some of my other episodes, you know that I don't believe that revival is all about miracles. I believe in miracles. I believe in the power of God, especially if you have heard my, some of my interviews, you know, some of the things that we've talked about, the incredible power of God that there is. And uh, healing and all that kind of stuff. But revival, I don't believe revival is defined by miracles. I know that's controversial. I know a lot of people will disagree with me, but I believe that revival is defined by transformation. And I say that because I've seen miracles happen and the person isn't changed. And so there isn't, I've been even in church services where revival is breaking out and the Holy Spirit is touching people, but where people are falling over and speaking in tongues and all of these things but they still walk out and there hasn't been any real transformation. It doesn't go beyond the church walls. And so I believe in order for something to be revival, it needs to touch lots of people and people need to be changed by them. And Bach, he was not a preacher. As I've said, he was not a normal, he's not a, a normal person in terms of the people I would normally look at as revival characters. He wasn't out on the streets preaching the gospel, but he absolutely brought transformation and absolutely brought the gospel into places that it would not have normally gone because of his entrance into society and his status as a Bach. And he, was, as a human being, he was extremely interesting. He was very flawed, as everyone is, as you'll see, you have seen in our other bios, and almost crazy-seeming sometimes, which 
of course, is it's fitting for all geniuses and most revivals, revivalists, and certainly most revival characters, the carriers. They all are kind of crazy in, in certain ways. They're at very least eccentric, and you have to be. If you're going to put yourself out in, in the glory of God and then go take it out, people are going to think you're nuts. And I love it. I think it's awesome. He spent from the year 1770 to 1730 causing trouble in Leipzig. And yet he was such a genius and he was so loved by the leaders and royals alike that he seemed untouchable by the people who he was actually working with and his peers who hated him. On one hand, he was spending so much focus and vast amounts of his time feverishly writing these cantatas and these massive works that were primarily focused on the gospels and lifting up Jesus. That is important to know. He was consumed with the gospel. The music that he wrote, the passions that he wrote were all about glorifying Jesus and giving glory to God. And he spent the majority of his focus on this. But on the other hand, he was such a rebel and he did not seem to care about anybody or anything but himself and his own music. He Everything else was just frivolous to him. By 1730, he was 45 years old. And Bach had come to this breaking point with the leaders of the, at the, of the church at Leipzig. They had this really long list of complaints against him. Uh, like I said before, in those days, church and government, they were really tightly woven together, which is what allowed so much persecution against the Protestants. Again, if you haven't listened to my podcast on John Knox, John Welch, I urge you to go back and do so for more information after you listen to this this podcast because those the events in those episodes happened uh, I, I, about 100, 200 years before the events of this uh, of, uh, of Bach's life. And so there was what I want to say 1500 years or 1200, 1200, 1300 years where the Catholic Church was all powerful. The Catholic Church, they there were yes, there were kings, yes, there were rulers, but the true ruler, re- leaders of the world were the Catholics. They were the ones whispering in the king's ears, especially in Europe. They were the ones who were were really directing things. And and in a lot of ways they still do over in Europe. But the truth is that what had happened is because of the power of the church in politics, the the church began to lash out against anyone they, they declared a heretic. Basically, anyone that was a threat to them, they would kill them. They were burning people at the stake. They were chopping off heads. They were... The, the Pope had raised armies in the name of God, and he would tell the Crusades, for example. The Pope raised an army where he said anyone who joins this army will be absolved, is just automatically forgiven of any sin, past, present, or future. And so the kind of people that joined the Crusades, they were not Christians. They were the worst. They were the thieves, the ruffians, the rapists, the murderers. All these people joined. And that's why the most of the church is so hated in the Muslim world, because the ch- supposedly the church, this is not truly the church, but supposedly the church sent these massive armies over to the Muslim world, and they were not Christians. They did not love Jesus. They were going and slaughtering, raping, stealing their way across the Silk Road and doing it with giant crosses on their armor and on their shields and saying they were doing it in the name of Jesus when they were doing it in the name of the devil. It was not Jesus. And so they they were, this is what happens whenever the church has all power, becomes all powerful, which is why if you really study the power that the church had and how politics get, whenever politics get involved in the church, people start to put God to the side and the Holy Spirit to the side and they become political activists. And it was, it's been the same since the time of Jesus. Whenever politics get involved in the church, it becomes a mess and that should not happen, which is why you will learn pretty quickly if you study why the United States was founded on the separation of church and state and free speech. Because once the church gets too involved in government and they become too powerful, they start to kill other people. It, love no longer is a thing. thing. That's the whole word right now in the church. Everyone's talking about love, 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 which is obviously from God. But 
if you'll notice, especially right now, and I'm not a political guy, I, I don't even pay too much attention to it. But if you look at the people who are getting very involved in politics, they become very hateful and argumentative and don't even act in the character of God anymore because it's all about politics and fighting back against people and trying to win points. And so Avak, he had all of, he, he was living in a time when all this stuff was mixed together. And so there were all of these politics that were mixed in with what Bach did. And he had to be a politician, but he was not a politician at all, but he had to mix with politics. And so what happened was the, the municipal leaders of Leipzig, they had a meeting together about Bach's behavior, behavior because he was such a rebel. He did, like I said, he didn't really seem to care about anybody or anything but himself and his music. And I, I imagine his family because they loved him so much. But in the, the municipal leaders meeting, they simply wrote this in their meeting minutes about him. He had not conducted himself as he should. But there's actually far more to it than that. And so here, here are some of the things that Bach had done that they were referring to. He had dismissed a choir boy that he apparently didn't like or approve of and sent him home without speaking to any of the leaders about. He himself left without telling anybody. Now, keep in mind, he was a genius, but he was an employee of these leaders. He was getting paid a salary by these leaders. And as a, as like the manager, to, per se, of the the choir and the students and all this kind of stuff, he didn't have the right to just fire people. And he certainly didn't have the right to just leave. And with this one particular time when he left, when uh, just without telling him, he was gone for three weeks. And later, so then nobody knew why he had left. Nobody knew what was going on. It, it was later on that he told somebody that he had left for three weeks to go compose and perform a birthday song for Duke Christian of Wissenfels. Apparently, he didn't feel like the local leaders were worth telling, which just it just tells you kind of his disdain for the local leaders, including the pastors. He he it was just he was a very interesting guy. So they they also wrote. And this is, this is a quote. They said that he was doing nothing in fulfillment of his teaching du duties. He was being paid to give lessons, singing lessons and uh, music lessons. And he simply was not showing up. He was just not showing up for class. And then whenever his, his employers would call him out on it and they would force him to give the lessons, this is again a quote, they said that he would do so most vexatiously. And they said, he is not even willing to explain himself. So he must have thought that he was too good to teach these terrible singers. And then not only, and then the, the, the leaders, his employers were not worth telling. And then after all of this, he left again, just got up and left in order so that he could perform his passion of Matthew at a funeral. Again, not telling his leaders. Even one of his peers and friends and admirers said, everything was true that has been mentioned against the cantor, the cantor being Bach. It was said that the biggest mistake the, le the leaders made about Bach was that whenever they hired him, they expected him to be a genius and an obedient subject, which they should have known was not going to be the case. You're not going to get both. Now, in Bach's defense... He did have some defenders in all of this. He wasn't universally hated or anything like that. One organist who was part of the negotiations of Bach's employment contract said from the beginning that Bach should have never been expected to teach in the school and be the music director. He was a composer and not a teacher, and he never liked teaching. He only did it because it was the only way that he could finance himself and, to, and practice his true passion, which was composing worship. The organist said, and this is my paraphrase, that when someone is expected to lead worship, they should be allowed to fully focus on that. If someone has to work a second job like teaching in a school, they don't have the energy or desire to compose and lead worship in church. And if someone is too tired and doesn't have the energy to compose, he isn't going to do a good job of it. Another point in defense of Bach's unwillingness to teach was the fact that whenever the year 1700 hit, Having these choirs of 40 to 50 choir boys that were genuine music lovers and kids who had grown up in church, that was fading away. 
the towns and universities didn't have didn't have the kind of money they used to have to sustain such a high quality group because you have to remember the reformation has happened so before this in the catholic churches the catholic church they were all powerful they had count uh, still still today if you look just at the the places where the pope lives and and I, sh- I know I should know the name. I'm just blanking on, on it on the top of my head right now. But these pla- they are, they're so lavish, and there's so much gold and money, and it's just ridiculous. And But whenever the Reformation happened, the Protestants, they did not inherit that money. The Protestants, they were poor, living in caves. They were... They they were traveling on foot. They were they they did not have the kind of money that the Catholic Church did. So the Protestants, they they wanted to have the same kind of gigantic choirs that the Catholics did. These Catholic churches that the Bach family would have been working with would have had, like I said, forty or fifty choir boys and incredible musicians who were elite trained musicians. But Bach did not have that. He didn't have that that uh, ability to have those people because the church didn't have that kind of money, and so he didn't have the the, the sustainability for these high quality groups. The former students were handpicked, trained, and only the best in town were selected, which is for sure what Bach was hoping for. But instead, he got the equivalent of pretty much anyone whose mom wanted her kid to sing in church, especially under the teaching of a legend like Bach himself, it was even, it has even been suggested that at that point, the refined students who would have come, who would have been in these Latin schools back in Bach's day or Luther's day before him, they would have been long gone. It is highly possible that the kids in school now, in Bach school, that they were uneducated hooligans who didn't know how to behave in church and were undisciplined, running around, not paying attention in class, and this would have just drove Bach crazy, would have driven him to abandon everything and, and not even bother trying to teach them. In the book that I've mentioned a couple of times, Bach, Music in the Castle of Heaven, he even, the, the writer, John Elliott Gardner, he even suggests, and again, this, he also said this is just imaginations, we, we don't really know, but he even had the image of students who were just sheer hooligans ro- running around, throwing bricks through windows, talking in class, laughing during class and Bach being so serious, he he definitely would not have put up with that. He would have just thought it was a joke. So Bach had all of these complaints against him and he went through a formal reprimand by the town and the church leaders. We don't know exactly how it went, but we do know that Bach went through a shaky time where he was considering leaving the city of Leipzig for a bigger and better city. But he ended up deciding to stay, and he seemed to have calmed down a bit after that, after that reprimand, because Leipzig was the center of music in that area. It was very famous for what they called their muses, musicians, who would travel from all over to compose. They would compete. They would show off their talent. It was essentially the Nashville, Tennessee of Germany. As a matter of fact, because he was able to calm down a little bit, not a lot, but able to calm down a little bit, he began rising through the ranks of musical society over the next years. And he began developing what was a new style of music for those times. He was he was so competitive against other competitors. From the time of his youth, he would compete against them in music competitions that had these huge prizes, and he certainly did not win them all. A lot of people voted against him because they preferred the other musician or simply because he was so unlikable that they would rather somebody else win. And uh, because of the politics, like I said, a lot of the stuff there was pol- was about politics. It wasn't so much about the, the beauty of the music. Not that other composers were not as good as Bach. There are definitely some very, very amazing composers out there. But in his case, he certainly was voted against a lot just because of his unlikability. So uh, Bach was not very like, liked by the local politicians, and much of his advancement had to do with outside influences he had, like Prince Leopold, the Dukes, and other royals that he was frequently asked to come play for. However, in his own town, he was not appreciated, which sounds a lot like a Bible verse that we know, which talks about how a prophet is ex- honored everywhere but in his own town. The, the competition between himself and other composers went down all the way to the doctrinal and moral levels. For example, his greatest revel, uh, rival at the time was a man named Johannes Riemer. <laughs> I love this. I, this, is, this is 
well, I don't, it's not necessarily a good thing, but it was just so clever and spiteful of Bach. And again, just one of his flaws. I love, I love how flawed, I just love flawed people. I love humanity. I love human people. And so Johannes Riemer famously said, nobody is content with his status or honor. And even the most humble man seeks to elevate his title. That was what he, he, he wrote down. And so, of course, because this is his competitor, his greatest competitor, Bach wrote a cantata, and the title of it was, I am content with the office dear God has allotted to me. He wrote a whole song just, just to sort of dig at Johannes Riemer. In, in 1735, Bach finished his epic, The Well-Tempered Cavalier, which, again, guys, go listen to it after this. Don't do it right now. Wait until after this and then go listen to it. You'll love it. It's beautiful. And in, in Leipzig, the town where Bach spent all of these years, there were three main gathering places for people. There was the church, there was the gardens, and there was the coffee house. If you aren't familiar with the history of coffee shops, the first known coffee shop was founded in the Ottoman Empire in the 1550s. And whenever they were first founded... They were pleasure houses where people would go to gamble, take drugs, have encounters with, quote, young, beautiful boys. They would do puppet shows. They would watch puppet shows. They would listen to stories, bards, muses. They would watch dances, and they would also dance themselves. Because of this, the original coffee houses were considered dens of sin and places where Christians should not be seen. And in the 1700s, they, they weren't quite as bad, but they were still seen as the place secular people went to listen to music and to entertain themselves, while the Christians went to church to do so. So as a result, the church and the coffee shop were constantly in competition. But Bach, because he was a musician, he had an end to the coffee shop. So when he wasn't leading worship in the church and had some free time or an invitation, he would go to the, shop, the coffee shop and play worship there. I can imagine just like the fact that he would play in Catholic churches, that this was probably super controversial at the time. And he probably had so much criticism from the other Protestants in the area. But Bach was never one to pay attention to any criticism anyway. So he just kept on doing what he did. It's really important to note that Bach was not an evangelist. He was not like some of the other people we've talked about on the podcast, like I have said before. He wasn't on the streets, pre streets preaching the gospel. He wasn't leading the masses to Jesus. As we've seen, he wasn't even good with people at all. He was, he was an introvert. He was not a people person. And it can be so easy to criticize someone, even in the past, for doing things the way that they did them. However, I think it's, I think it's important to take into account what Jesus said in John 4, 37, which he said, For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. Also, the Apostle Paul, he talked in another place about how he sowed the seeds of faith, Barnabas watered them, and God made them grow. We all have our different roles in the kingdom. The people who reap tend to get the most fame and recognition, while the people who sow are often criticized by the reapers because they aren't reaping. Because most people think reaping has the most value, largely because it's the most measurable of all the, the aspects of this in the kingdom. But in terms of revival, Bach was not a reaper. He was a waterer. He was a worshiper. He was surrounded by secular competitors who were fiercely against him, and he would have gone that route as well. But his whole life, or he could have gone the same route of being a, just a secular musician if he wanted popularity. But his whole life, even with all of its flaws, he continually dedicated his music to God and his the focus of the words of his music were always on Jesus and on the Gospels. And it was in 1735, here in the midst of all of this, that Bach published his first book of organ music. Bach matured uh, a notable amount over the following years. The complexity of his music was dramatically, notably better, a lot of people say. Uh, but he also started composing some of his most beautiful and historic music uh, in, in the, the Castle of Heaven, the book Music in the Castle of Heaven. It says this about the older Bach. Earlier in his career, he clearly did not possess the range of experience, the structural and stylistic framework, or the opportunity to carry it through to fulfillment. 
this is the time when he wrote his most complex passions and worship. Now, passions are the larger works that he did that are, you know, two hours long and, and, and uh, just the more complex stuff that he did. These gigantic, almost operatic musical pieces that he did that are pages and pages long. During the last years of his life, the mental stress of life itself seemed to start to get to him. He became more and more reclusive. He started revisiting more meticulously than ever his works. He, he would write a piece of music and then he would keep going back and, and redoing it more and more, which was not common for him. And it, I know age was, was affecting him for sure, but he was like, it was almost like he was trying to top himself. He was trying to write something that was completely different. It was unique music and he would get frustrated because he couldn't seem to come up with what he was looking for, for the response to what he was looking for, for the, the music that he was looking for. And so it, it was, it was like it was there, but he couldn't get it on paper. And he, he also, he took up this saying that he was, people quoted him as saying pretty frequently, which was, it ought to be possible to do everything. And I love that saying. He was, he was referring to whatever he was trying to do with his music, but that's just a great saying. It's, it's just a biblical saying, right? All things are, are possible through Christ. It, it's just, as, as your faith be it, so unto you. And for Bach, he had faith, and man, did he compose some amazing music. But, that was, but he, was, he was starting to, his health was starting to fail. And so he, he would say that it ought to be possible to do everything. But sadly, in 1749, not only could he not do everything, but his ability to do anything at all began to wane. His surviving notes at that point in his life, they show his handwriting started to, to deteriorate. His, and, and this was kind of a slap in the face to him because his peers, competitors, and the public officials, when they saw that his health was beginning to fail— while he was still alive, they began preparing for his death, and they started actively searching for his, for a successor. They started doing auditions for someone to take his place, and this this really hurt Bach quite a bit because he wasn't dead yet, and they were acting like he was already dead. And it's just it was amazing because he miracul seemingly miraculously recovered for a time. It didn't last very long, but all of the sudden he rallied. And his health came back to him. His strength came back to him. He actually rallied enough that he was even able to go and perform. He was performing again. And it, they said that he wasn't performing the most complex things, but he was able to perform. He was able to do, to do what he did, what his passion was. And when people were shocked by this, when people were shocked that he came back into the public eye and that he was performing again, he actually said, he, he publicly th gave thanks to God and said that God had authority over any worldly pretensions, meaning that things that man think are for sure going to happen, God is the one at the end of the day who makes the ultimate decision. And that is the truth. Bach knew what he was talking about. Bach, he lived through the summer of that year, but again, after the summer, he got sick and then whenever that happened, his eyesight started to go as well as everything else. Some people suggested that he had some kind of advanced diabetes. There's no way for us to know. But just the, according to the symptoms that he had, the things that, we, that were seen in what was happening to him, it seems, it seems like it was some kind of advanced diabetes. I don't know. And neither does anybody else, truthfully. But that's what they think may have happened. It got to the point where... He was losing his eyesight, and he finally was bedridden. But he continued to write music. This is the thing. Every, everything that man did was about worship. He was on his deathbed, couldn't see, and so he dictated his compositions. And he seemed to sense that his death, I mean, it was obvious, of course, but he, the day he died, he seemed to sense that he was going to die. And so what he did, his fi what you could would call his last words— were a song that he composed right before he died and he dictated it to an unnamed friend. Now, I don't want to pretend that I can pronounce this correctly, but I'm just going to tell you, you can look it up as well. Uh, just look up box last, the last thing that he composed, but I'm just going to, this is what was written in the book music in the castle of heaven. 
Yeah, I'm just going to read it exactly as it's written, okay? So if you speak German, forgive forgive what you're about to hear. But it says BWV 668A. Those are the first those are the letters and the the, the numbers right before the title. And it says when we're in Hosten Noten Sein. I don't know what that means. In the book, he usually said the translations of the the songs. That's why I was able to write like the Well Templared Clavier and things like that. But for this one, he didn't give the, the translation for it. So I don't know what it means. But I do know that that is the very last thing that Bach wrote. And he composed it blind, just telling uh, telling somebody how to write. I don't know how you tell somebody how to write, but I'm not a musician. So I'm sure musicians out there, they know they can, they can explain it. He died on July 28th at just before... Uh, July 28th, just after 8.15 p.m., and he had written well over a 1,000 compositions in his lifetime. There are 1,080 that are totally undisputed, but it's also well known that there are hundreds that have been lost over time. I mentioned before that just in those three years, he had he had written 300 compositions, and we know that 100 of them were, were lost. And the crazy thing to me is that these weren't three-minute worship songs. These are some of them were hours long with 40 to 50 voices, multiple instruments, all playing in harmony together. And over two thirds of them were directly written as worship. Bach was a unique man. There has never been anyone like him since who has dedicated every waking moment, every day of their lives to composing such elaborate and powerful music to the King of Kings with such intensity and genius. He was faithful to his family. He was seen as a rebel by the religious leaders of the time. He was held in high esteem by everyone who, by everyone, and hated by most. Even by those who hated him, they respected him. But for those of us who believe in the power of God and the supernatural, one thing is for sure, Bach was getting his music straight out of the castle of heaven. So that is it. That is the life of Bach. Thank you for listening. Please share this. If you're interested in this book, if you want to buy it, please consider buying it off of the show notes just to help me out. Again, if you want to support the show, even if not financially, guys, just help share this. Tell some friends about it. Introduce them to this podcast. Sometimes just sharing it on Facebook helps, but a lot of times if you know someone who's interested in a topic like this, these interviews or these episodes, it can help if you just just send it directly to them. That just helps where we're growing and uh, I'm, I'm really, I am really, really thankful, genuinely thankful for those of you who listen and for those of you who write in. And so I just appreciate it. Please, please share. And also there are some more incredible interviews coming up. And this next week, we have two really good episodes coming up. And then the next bio episode, I actually have not decided who is going to be in my next bio episode. This is actually the first time I haven't made a decision because I'm thinking about doing someone like Isaac Newton, doing a scientist who is a believer, but I, uh, but I'm not sure. We'll see. I'm thinking about it. I might do him. I'll let you guys know in, in, in the next few days, I'm sure. So thank you all for listening. I hope that you have a wonderful, wonderful weekend, that you be blessed. Don't forget that we do have a Facebook page, the Revival Carriers Podcast. I do post on there. I did live stuff on there. It isn't super active. A lot of people are just listening straight from the podcast or listening on YouTube. But if you want to uh, keep up with some things, I, I don't post all the time, so you're not going to be bombarded with stuff. But sometimes I put little extra pictures and stuff on there. And uh, yeah, I'd love to hear from you guys. Thank you for those of you who have written in. Please keep writing because it really encourages me. Whenever you write me and you tell me that you were blessed by the episode, it encourages me to keep doing more episodes. So thank you all. Be very, very blessed. And I'll see you in just a few days with the next interview. Mm-hmm.